Before we approach this subject, we need to be reminded, as we have no doubt often been reminded before, that the religious atmosphere of England has been for many generations individualistic. For if we are to get near the truth, we must always be remembering what is our own special bias and in what way our minds are naturally warped. It is so often just the things people take most for granted, which most need reconsidering. Individualism was the great preconception of our religion. An Englishman's home was, of all unchristian things, his castle. He protested his right to do what he liked with his own. He claimed that a man's whole civic duty was to clean his own doorstep. His philosophy was based upon the rights of man, that is, of the individual. Every man for himself was his creed, to which was piously appended, and God for us all. Though there were critics who added a remark as to who was expected to take the hindmost. In religious practice, he summed up his convictions in the sturdy protest, no man shall come between me and my God, thus claiming proprietary rights, even where reverence would have suggested more discretion. With these ideas, it was not to be wondered at that England was divided by the rise of a large number of sects. Each new separation was hailed as a sign of the religious vitality of our wonderful country. Indeed, I remember one of the popular children's books upon which I myself was brought up, which stated that although Scotland very nearly attained the first place among religious countries because of its exemplary observance of the Sabbath, Yet England outdistanced it in piety because England possessed the largest number of religious denominations. To dwell upon this would be to flog a dead horse. For during the last 50 years, the tide has been turning. Not by any means only in the English Catholic revival, but everywhere. Presbyterians in Scotland without the excuse of theological disagreement, were till recently split into three separate churches. We have now seen the Free Church and the United Presbyterian Church united in spite of great difficulties. And no better instance of the turn of the tide could be found than that. In fact, though decisions, divisions still abound, as we know only too well in this country, the point of view has everywhere changed. Everybody condemns division. No Matthew Arnold is now needed to pour scorn on the man who boasts of the dissidence of dissent. But though it is difficult to heal our divisions, no reasonable person is proud of them now. We all acknowledge that, that a common faith in the All-Father and a common love of our one Master ought to be the strongest bond of brotherhood, that to be a Christian ought to mean to be a member of an unbroken fellowship. In fact, we are witnessing the rehabilitation of two forgotten articles of the Creed, the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints. But the process is far from complete. It has only begun. And one reason why it is as yet so partial is that we have given much less attention to the second of those clauses than to the first. We have heard a great deal. Sometimes in Anglican pulpits, we are rather worried by hearing too much about the church, but we have not heard enough about the communion of saints. 
Indeed, I think if we were to set an examination paper on this article of the Creed, not only to the indifferent churchmen, but if we set it even to those who are zealous, including a large number of clergy, we should get very vague and incoherent answers. I think most of us do not quite know what we mean by it, and consequently are not at all sure if we believe in it. The difficulty is enhanced by the fact that the two principal words in this clause are both slightly technical, and the second is used with a meaning different from that which it bears in common speech. What then is the exact meaning of the words communion of saints? Communion, of course, means fellowship and comes from a Latin word meaning shared together. We constantly forget how strong a word it is, so strong, so intimate and vital, that it is applied to the union with Christ in the sacrament. In pure English, its equivalent is fellowship or brotherhood. Perhaps if we said, I believe in the fellowship of saints, or even if we said, I believe in the union of saints, we should have a far stronger realisation of what, it, what is meant. For to many this word communion, instead of being stronger, is weaker than union and hardly has any meaning at all. Again, the word saints is not used at all in its common meaning. It is used in its scriptural sense, as when St Paul describes the Christians to whom he writes as saints. He does not mean that they are very good, still less, of course, that they are canonised. He calls them saints and at the same time accuses them of many sins. A saint in the New Testament is simply one who has been consecrated or sanctified by admission into the Church of God, who has been set apart by baptism to be a member of Christ, in fact, a Christian. When St. Paul writes to the saints in Corinth, or speaks of the poor saints at Jerusalem, he means the ordinary members of the congregation at Corinth and in Jerusalem, those who were being helped by the local relief committee of deacons. I believe in the communion of saints, therefore, means precisely this. I believe in the fellowship of Christians, or I believe in the brotherhood of the baptised. But, some may say, though our notions may be vague, at least we have always thought that this article of the Creed referred to those who had departed this life. Yes, it does, but it refers also to the living. We cannot expect to enjoy the fellowship of a fisherman merely because he has died. The communion of saints includes not only those fishermen and carpenters and tax collectors who followed our Lord in Palestine, but also their modern representatives whom we see today in London. Perhaps most converted fisherfolk and carpenters at the present day are dissenters. We may regret that they do not appreciate belief in the Holy Catholic Church. But after all, did they not become dissenters because we did not believe in the communion of saints? They were despised and were refused any vocation or ministry in the church, and therefore they took refuge among the Methodists and in other bodies. This is the more strange because I think it is accurate to say that According to our late financial standard for the ministry, all the apostles would have been excluded from the Church of England, with the possible exception of Judas. But to the men who put this article into the creed, the comprehensive use of the word saint offered no difficulty. 
to them the church triumphant was just as real as the church militant. To them death was but a little barrier. To them, therefore, it was natural to use a word which included the most obscure member of the church on earth and the most exalted saint in heaven. Let us then, first of all, see that we grasp the elements of the doctrine. Let us remember that the spirit of exclusiveness on earth is a negation of the fellowship of heaven. Let us throw it once for all to the winds and have done with it. For it is assuredly of the world and not of God. Few of us have not been held by it at some time. Yet it is even against the best canons of the world. For it is a mistake to think that exclusiveness is a sign of good social position. The higher a man's rank, the more he realises that he can afford to know everybody and the more free he is from that miserable fear of losing caste by being friendly and courteous to all. At the top of all, the king knows everybody, and the most assiduously cultivated art of royalties is that of remembering faces. It ought not indeed to be necessary that an argument from the world should be used to press an obvious Christian duty. Yet it cannot be wrong to remember that no one loses anything which makes life pleasant or noble by holding out the hand of fellowship to another. Indeed, no one can have happiness in this world or the next without this spirit of brotherhood. For fellowship is heaven and lack of fellowship is hell. Fellowship is life and lack of fellowship is death. In God's eyes, we are all saints, all set apart in his name. And he only knows in what order of excellence or of worthlessness we may stand. But we know at least this, that the Church of God is paralysed today by her want of fellowship, by her failure to practise one of the first duties of the Christian religion, by her so frequent exclusion of the communion of saints from her real creed. The framers of the creed then were surely right in refusing to distinguish between the saints in heaven and the saints on earth, between the church triumphant and the church militant. The two planes have proved themselves inseparable. That neglect of our earthly brother which has brought upon us the awful problem of the unemployed, the silent starving multitudes of respectable artisans and many another misery, has gone side by side with our neglect of the brethren departed, with our ignoring of the saints in heaven. For fundamentally, the two are inseparable. If Christianity means communion, if it means fellowship, then every man has a right to come between us and our God. And every man helps us to get nearer to God, whether in this world or the next. If Christianity means fellowship, then the love of God's suffering ones is as essential a part of it as the love of his holy ones. And the one affection will be strong or weak as the other is strong or weak. We shall feel the blessing of the prayers of the happy saints in heaven, as we shall feel the call to succour the poor saints on earth. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Indeed, our individualism must give way to the bond of love, for in the sight of God there is a unity of souls that passes our imagining. The communion of saints then has a very plain and simple meaning. It simply means the fellowship of Christians, the word saint being here used in its scriptural sense. 
At first sight, we may seem to reduce the meaning of the article when we say that the communion of saints simply means that all Christian people should love and help each other because they are knit together in one communion and fellowship. But it only has this effect because our idea of fellowship has become so poor and limited a thing. We have narrowed it to mean that small fraction of the Christian church which happens to be living now in the world. It was thus narrowed because people withdrew all the rest of the church from their prayers. The great individualistic movement of the last three centuries not only broke up the communion of saints on earth by its sectarianism, but it also severed the living from the dead. For can you have Christian fellowship without prayer? What a mockery should we think it if any of us professed to love a particular person and then never prayed for him? A Christian parent, for instance, who never prayed for his children, or a Christian congregation that never prayed for mankind. It is, of course, precisely the same with the departed. There can be no fellowship with them without prayer. Indeed, it is far more the case with them because they are in the unseen world, and therefore prayer is the only means by which we can have fellowship with them. We then have lost the idea of that larger fellowship through our lessening of the scope of prayer. And that is why at first sight, it seems a narrowing of the idea to remember that communion of saints means simply the fellowship of Christian people. Really, it broadens the idea and gives it the ample proportions of a philosophic truth. Let me give two historic instances of this. This article was inserted in the creed about the fourth century to guard, like the other clauses, against a particular heresy. Dr. Harnack has stated that it was inserted because a Spanish priest named Vigilian Vigilantius about the year 400, denied the intercession of the saints in heaven. But it is probable that the clause is somewhat earlier than Vigilantius. In any case, he is justified in saying that we must accept it as highly probable that these words were actually taken to mean communion with the martyrs and chosen saints. Thus, they were originally not an explanation of the expression the Holy Catholic Church, but a continuation of it. This article was then inserted with special regard to the departed, and yet it was so worded as to include the whole church. It would have been easy to put in a word to restrict the meaning of the word saints to those in heaven, but the fathers preferred to keep the broadest and most inclusive meaning. The next instance shows clearly that this was thoroughly understood in the Middle Ages, in the period that is when England was built, built up as a great Christian nation. It is from the order for the visitation of the sick in the Serum Manual. The priest is directed to question the sick man on the creed, explaining it as he goes on. When he comes to this article, he says, Dearest brother, dost thou believe in the communion of saints? That is, that all men who live in charity are partakers of all the gifts of grace which are dispensed in the church, and that all who are in fellowship with the just here in grace are in fellowship with them also in glory? The meaning could hardly be more accurately or more admirably set forth. Now, the first result of a realization of the simple meaning of the article is this. So far from the bearings of it being reduced, they are at once shown to include not merely the baptized on earth and the saints in heaven, but also those departed persons who are no longer on earth and not yet in heaven. 
In other words, the article includes not merely the church militant and the church triumphant, but also the church expectant. Or to put it in yet another way, the communion of saints includes prayer for the departed. This part of the Christian faith has been greatly restored among us during the last 50 years, although with such timidity that the old edition of Hymns Ancient and Modern contains hardly a line that frankly recognises it. But every year its restoration has become more secure and irresistible. For it was not only part of the Tractarian revival, but was welcomed by most broad minded men from Charles Kingsley to Archbishop Temple. The refusal to pray for the dead could, in fact, only survive so long as Calvinism survived. If it were true that God predestinated nearly everybody to endless damnation, but had arranged beforehand that a small, selected minority should go to heaven, apart from their own action altogether, then it was clearly no use to pray for the departed. We might indeed ask, what was the use of praying for the living either? In fact, that is the ultimate logical conclusion. A man's soul is his soul, whether it be in a mortal body or not. And if we can help it by prayer, we can help it because it is a soul, and not merely because it is a soul dwelling in a body. If we cannot pray for a man because he is dead, and therefore in the irrevocable flames of hell, it is equally useless to pray for him when he is alive and walking towards those flames by the predestining will of God. It is often said that Calvinism, though a kind of devil worship, was at least logical. But here surely its logic failed. Calvinists were better than their creed, or they would not have prayed. They would rather have said with Omar, and that inverted bowl they call the sky, where under crawling, cooped, we live and die, lift not your hands to it for help, for it as impotently moves on, moves as you or I. The church was more logical when she declared the power of prayer to be boundless, and believing in the supreme reality of the spirit, persisted in ignoring the merely physical barrier of death and declared her belief in the communion of saints. She was also more logical in her belief in the intermediate state. For if God is just, and if there is a divine and loving purpose in the world, it follows inexorably that there must be a place where those go who are neither good enough for heaven nor bad enough for hell. People may boggle at the word purgatory, and will continue to do so, so long as they are in the false position of modern English Protestantism, having renounced the doctrine of Calvin, and yet still retaining those prejudices about the state of the departed, which were built up on that doctrine. But German Protestantism is more enlightened. I have quoted one great Lutheran, let me quote two more, partly because their words are so much better than any of mine could be, and partly because they illustrate the fact that the great leaders of Protestant thought have long accepted the position which few English evangelicals or nonconformists have yet brought themselves to face. Leibniz says, Nearly all teachers, ancient and modern, have agreed that there is a fatherly chastening or purification after this life, whatever it might consist in. The souls themselves on their departure from the body receive enlightenment, and seeing for themselves now, for the first time, the shortcomings of the life that they have ended, and deeply pained by the sense of the horribleness of sin, they welcome the chastening with satisfaction and would not, if they could, pass to their blissful communion, consummation without it. The next witness is Martensen, the greatest of Lutheran theologians, 
whose words are as profound as they are enlightening. As no soul leaves this present existence in a fully complete and prepared state, we must suppose that there is an intermediate state, a realm of progressive development, in which souls are prepared and matured for the final judgment. Though the Romish doctrine of purgatory is repudiated because it is mixed up with so many crude and false positions, it nevertheless contains the truth that the intermediate state must in a purely spiritual sense be a purgatory designed for the purifying of the soul. If we inquire what hints scripture gives regarding the nature of this kingdom, we find that the New Testament calls it Hades, St. Luke 16 verse 23. The kingdom of the dead is a kingdom of subjectivity, a kingdom of calm thought and self-fathoming, a kingdom of remembrance in the full sense of the word. In such a sense, I mean that the soul now enters into its own inmost recesses, resorts to that which is the very foundation of life, the, the true substratum and source of all existence. Hence arises the purgatorial nature of this state. As long as man is in this present world, he is in a kingdom of externals, wherein he can escape from self-contemplation and self-knowledge by the distractions of time, the noise and tumult of the world. But at death he enters into a kingdom the opposite of all this. His soul finds itself in a kingdom of pure realities. The manifold voices of this worldly life, which during this earthly life sounded together with the voices of eternity, grow dumb, and the holy voice now sounds alone, and hence the realm of the dead becomes a realm of judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to judgment. Hebrews 11 verse 27. So far is the human soul in this state from drinking forgetfulness that it may evermore be said, their works do follow them. Revelation 14 verse 13. Those moments of life which were hurried away and scattered in the stream of time rise again, collected together and absolutely present to the, to the recollection. A vision which must be the source either of joy or terror because it presents to view the real and deepest truth of consciousness, which may not only be comforting and bliss-giving, but judging and condemning truth also. From Martinson's Christian Dogmatics. The spiritual fact thus sublimely expressed was no doubt materialized and vulgarized in the Middle Ages. And there certainly was a Romish doctrine concerning purgatory, which was rightly condemned by our 22nd article, as indeed it was condemned shortly after by the Council of Trent itself. But the crudest and most material views of purgatory and the most mechanical dealing in indulgences were surely not so bad as the crude and material ideas about hell that took their place and the mechanical predestining of mankind to the pit, which were the settled belief of most Englishmen till recent years. And even in the Italy of 1560, it was possible for a holy and inspired woman like St. Catherine of Genoa to write about purgatory in a very different way. In chapter 2 of her treatise, she says, I do not believe it would be possible to find any joy comparable to that of a soul in purgatory, excepting the joy of the blessed in paradise, a joy which goes on increasing day by day as God more and more flows in upon the soul, which he does abundantly in proportion as every hindrance to his entrance is consumed away. And in chapter 5, the souls in purgatory 
having their wills perfectly conformed to the will of God, and hence partaking of his goodness, remain satisfied with their condition, which is one of entire freedom from the guilt of sin. Cleansed thus from all sin, and united in will to God, they see God clearly according to the light he imparts to them. They are conscious too what a good it is to enjoy God, and for this very end souls were created. Here I will break off. In the last chapter we considered the communion of saints in a church militant. In this I have tried to give some impression of that communion in a church expectant. We may call that state by many names, and if the word purgatory still has wrong associations, we shall probably be wiser not to use it, lest we set back the truth by arousing prejudice. But whether we call it the waiting church, or the state of purification, or paradise, or Hades, some such state there is. Our ideas about it cannot be but guesswork, for our minds are conditioned by our present environment. But we are sure that those who are there know that it is very good, and would not change their condition if they could. There is no discontent there and no injustice, for there is no sin. And also we are sure that from the days of our Lord, the church militant prayed for them, and that in the primitive church, this was part of the communion of saints, was quite as keenly felt as at any later time. We have felt the going out of our hearts to them in prayer. We have felt the broadening of our love, the deepening of our hope, the strengthening of our faith in prayer for them. We know too that prayer helps them. And we are glad to think that prayer will be helping us when we are with them. Let me give a summary at this point. The communion of saints means simply the brotherhood of the baptised or the fellowship of Christians. We might indeed translate the clause into gospel language and call it the love of one another. But during the later ages, this, the social side of Christianity, has been largely forgotten. It has been forgotten both in regard to the church militant and in regard also to those far larger portions of Christendom which are in the next world, the church expectant and the church triumphant. In other words, the church here has been split up by separatism, both in, ecclesi in ecclesiastical and in secular things, by schism in the one and by individualism in the other. At the same time, it has been forgotten that we live in close communion with the departed who belong to the church in the next world. The principal means of spiritual communion is prayer, and therefore the communion of saints is principally realised in our prayer for each other. If we pray more for each other here upon earth, we shall love each other more. Here in our parishes and congregations, the high church and low church will love each other more and trust each other more and help each other more. And churchmen and nonconformists will love each other more. And Roman Catholics and Eastern Christians and Anglicans and Protestants will all love each other more. Thus, by mutual prayer, not by praying that we may destroy every other view but our own, and score a great party victory, but by real honest prayer that God's will may be done, that the truth may prevail, and that we may be knit together in one communion and fellowship of love. By such prayer and love, reunion will come about among Christians. It was lost in party hatred. 
it will not be won again by a continuation of party methods. It will be won if we owe no man anything, not even a grudge, but to love one another. In that spirit, let us face the future faithfully. But if God be a God of love, who willeth that all men should be saved, if we believe, as according to the Catechism we do believe, in God the Son, who hath redeemed me and all mankind, then we must include in our love and our prayers that great multitude of departed men and women who were partly good and partly bad at their death and whom God can still make fit for heaven. In other words, we must include the church expectant in our love and prayer. The presence of our blessed Lord is vouchsafed to those who, like the penitent thief, are with him in paradise. There they are being perfected by his sanctifying power and pass on from stage to stage, from strength to strength, as they journey onwards till they are ready to join the blessed company of the spirits of just men made perfect in the church triumphant. But there is a further consideration. This prayer in the communion of saints must be mutual. Not only do we pray for our departed friends, but they pray for us. Thus is the fellowship made complete and the last sting of death removed. How different would be the lot of the bereaved if they believed and realised that this is a vital, glorious fact. Christians have been faithless and unchristian about death. The gospel has been too bright for many gloomy minds. We see it not only in the dumb resignation of so many modern hymns, we see it not only in the pagan monuments, the broken pillars, the extinguished torches, the grinning skulls of our grandfathers, we see it also in pre Reformation times, in the hideous pictures of the triumph of death, the danse macabre of the later Middle Ages, and we see it also in the Romish doctrine concerning purgatory, which, though it did have an intense realisation of the lives of departed souls, yet pictured them as the victims of unbearable bodily torture in flames of fire. The dominant theology of the later medieval period the theology of St Thomas Aquinas denied that the souls in purgatory could pray for those on earth. I sometimes wonder whether it was not this denial which made the Romish, i.e. the later medieval doctrine concerning purgatory, possible. If people had at that time realised that the departed were praying for us and for each other, the idea of purification would not have given place to the idea of torture. Some years ago, a man came up to me in church after service and said, my mother is dead and I know I may pray for her, but I feel I must also ask her to pray for me. Is this wrong? The answer is, unless you believe in the infallibility of St Thomas Aquinas, there is no reason why you should think it wrong. The Eastern Church, which, through its intense conservatism, has escaped many bad influences, as well as some good ones, is always a valuable witness as to the historic uncorrupted faith of Christendom. And the Eastern Church has always taught that the departed in the Church expected pray for us, even as we pray for them. And the multitudinous inscriptions in the catacombs leave us in no doubt as to what was the faith of the primitive church. Ancient inscriptions of the second or third centuries can still be read in which parents ask the prayers of their little dead children with the words, pray for thy parents. Here are one or two other examples from these early catacombs of Rome. Third century. 
vivas in pace et pete pro nobis. Third century, januaria bene refrigera et roga pro nos, or pro nobis. Fourth century, roges pro nobis, qui ascimus te in Christi. Live in peace and pray for us. January, rest well and pray for us. Pray for us because we know thou art in Christ. The entire absence of such sentiments from the funereal inscriptions of both medieval and modern Christianity shows in the most striking manner how completely we have broken with the belief of the first six centuries. And is it not a matter that vitally concerns the happiness of mankind? A man who can in perfect faith say, pray for us because we know thou art in Christ, in Christo, is a man who goes through life unterrified by death, indifferent to the advancing years, unbroken by bereavement, a man for whom the most anxious questionings and the worst fears of humanity do not exist. I am purposely passing over the, mo the moment, for the moment, the fact that the saints in the restricted sense, i.e. the saints in glory, pray for us. That, I suppose, is admitted on all hands, though it is very little realised among us. The one point I wish to press now is this, that less exalted Christians, our own friends, for instance, pray for us. Surely the realisation of this will preserve us, not only from the Romish doctrines concerning purgatory on the one hand, but also on the other from the Romish doctrine concerning invocation of saints, from the exaggeration, that is to say, which led to something very like the deification of the saints. If we remember that our own humble friends also pray for us, we shall not be likely to give quasi-divine honour to any departed spirit. But, it may be asked, do the departed know what is going on here? Well, the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews seems to have thought that they did. For in the twelfth chapter, after speaking of the heroes of old time, and including Rahab in his list, says, Therefore let us also seeing we are compassed about with so great a crowd of witnesses, lay aside every weight and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Here it is impossible, as Bishop Westcott says, to exclude the thought of the spectators in an amphitheatre. The writer regards himself and his friends as placed in an arena and contending for a great prize. Around, row upon row in the theatre, are the great cloud of heroes watching the struggle that is going on below. Let us then accept this great comfort and encouragement that the departed rest in no blind and hidden place, but in a higher and more transcendent plane than ours where they have life and have it more abundantly, where they have sight and knowledge and love because they are with Christ. Every lack of faith within the church leads to the uprising of some sect which bears witness to the forgotten truth. This truth was forgotten and hundreds of people have taken refuge in spiritualism for we forgot a truth which corresponds to a God-given human instinct, an instinct so universal that pagan races like the Chinese and Japanese have reached their highest moral and spiritual development through the practice of ancestor worship. Is there not a Christian counterpart to this? There is, in the, forgot in the doctrine of the communion of saints. It was forgotten and in Puritan North America, and the Puritan North of England, 
where it was most forgotten, spiritualism now appears, not only as a belief, but as an organised dissenting body, with flourishing chapels in such towns as Newcastle and Leeds. And now in recent years, there has arisen a body of scientific investigators, F. W. H. Myers and Edmund Gurney, and Professor Sidgwick, and Professor Barrett, and Sir William Crookes, and Mr. Alfred R. Wallace, the scientist who shares with Darwin the honour of the discovery of the secret of evolution. These men founded a society for the free investigation of the new and yet old phenomena that can no longer be passed over. That investigation is still proceeding. Some of the greatest minds are convinced by the great mass of evidence already accumulated that the power of the departed not only to know about us but to communicate with us has been proved. Whether this be so or not, it is certain that the old materialism is no longer adequate, that the spirit of man has many strange and wonderful powers which were formerly ignored by science. And it is certain that among these powers is that of seeing and knowing things without the use of physical means. If at one time the current trend of knowledge was against the reality of the spirit and of the spirit world, it is certain that the new facts which are coming to light are profoundly changing the intellectual atmosphere of our times. And nothing is more likely than that the fellowship of souls, the communion of saints, living and departed, may soon everywhere be accepted as a matter which has been scientifically proved. Faith long ago discovered it. God has not left man to wait in darkness upon the slow discoveries of science, but has given him intuitions and revelations of the truth. Christendom has often failed in her practice and wavered in her faith and debased her creed, but at least she has never ceased to say, I believe in the communion of saints. So far I have endeavoured to show that the fellowship of Christians must be one of love and prayer, that it includes those in this world and the next alike, that it involves our prayer, praying for the living and also for the departed that it involves the living and also the departed praying for us. And I went on to say in chapter 3 that therefore we might ask our departed friends to pray for us. But now I want you to consider the objection which is sometimes made to this. I suppose most people, if you talk to them quietly, would admit all we have said up to this point. They would say, Yes, those in the next world love and pray for us. But, they would object, we cannot ask them to pray. That would be invocation and would treat them as if they were everywhere as God is. Well, first I would put in a demurrer from dear old Sir Thomas Brown, who so often struck the last word of common sense into the midst of, this, of his controversial age. They, he says, that to refute the invocation of saints, have denied that they have any knowledge of our affairs below, have proceeded too far, and must pardon my opinion till I can thoroughly answer that piece of scripture. At the conversion of a sinner, the angels in heaven rejoice. Now, in the New Testament, there is, it is true, Nothing about asking saints departed to pray for us. But the reason is simple. Very few of the saints were then departed. The question had not arisen, except in a few cases. Yet I cannot think that St. Paul imagined St. Stephen to have left off praying for him when his body sank down under the last stone. Remember, it seems reasonable to imagine that St. Paul always loved St. Stephen and that his heart went out to the martyr whose last words on earth 
had been for his murderers, and that he knew he was still helped by Stephen's prayers, and never let a day pass without thinking of that brave, loving hero and of the prayers which he was still offering. The apostles have not have not left us their books of private devotion. I expect they did not use any. But I think St. Paul's would have shown that he knew the full meaning of his own words. We being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. And that he used to the saints who had already fallen asleep the words which he addressed to his own disciples, brethren, pray for us. And I think that St. John's meditations must have included aspirations for that intercession which he himself described in so vivid an image. And another angel came and stood over the altar, having a golden censer, and it was given unto him much incense, that he should add it unto the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. What reason have we indeed for limiting the knowledge of the departed? Even Dives in his torments knew that his brothers were not converted. The saints under the altar, the souls of them that had been slain for the word of God, knew what was going on when they cried with a great voice, saying, How long, O Master, the holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And if they know, why should they not know that men are asking for their prayers? The whole Christian church, east and west, has from primitive times agreed in believing that the saints in glory at least do know. And the theologians have given this as the reason that God knows what we are saying, that the saints know God, and that in this way the saints know what we are saying. Sometimes they express this by an image. They spoke of the mirror of God. In the perfect knowledge of God, as in a mirror, they said, the saints see all that is happening on the earth. Dr. Wilberforce, Wilberforce, the present Archdeacon of Westminster, has drawn another illuminating metaphor from one of the commonest appliances of modern science. He writes, as every telephone in this great city opens communication with another telephone through a centre common to both, so do sundered souls, though between them lies all the inexplicable mystery of another world, find each other in the presence and on the heart of a Lord and Saviour common to both. We cannot see them in that other dimension of space, neither could we see them if they were at the Antipodes. But whenever we draw near to the heart of the risen Lord, we draw near also to those who are in the world of spirits. Personally, I believe, Dr. Wilberforce continues, that the certificated trysting place of this spirit communion between sundered souls is a sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, and that at the supreme moment, the hearts of earth-soiled, sin-bewildered men reach for a while into the paradise of God, and are able to say without exaggeration and hyperbole, therefore with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. This is a modern illustration, and it helps to show how true was the conviction of the ancient fathers and teachers of the church. They knew nothing about telephones, and they knew nothing about wireless telegraphy. They had not such illustrations to help them, but they did know, because they were close to God, 
and because they were free from the blindness of materialism, they did know that soul could communicate with soul in the fellowship of saints. They knew this also because they were not blinded by reaction. One of the worst results of exaggeration is that it causes the pendulum to swing so far on the other side. And so the Mariolatry and the Hagiolatry, into which popular religion drifted in the Middle Ages, caused a violent reaction. And people came to deny the possibility and the desirability of communication between soul and soul. But even in the violent reaction of Puritan England, there were men who did not lose sight of the communion of saints. Let me quote as an instance the famous and holy Puritan Richard Baxter, the author of The Saints' Rest. He wants not friends that hath thy love, and may converse and walk with thee, and with thy saints here and above, with whom forever I must be. Before thy throne we daily meet, as joint petitioners to thee. In spirit we each other greet, and shall again each other see. In the communion of saints is wisdom, safety, and delight. And when my heart declines and faints, it's raised by their heat and light. These men, the ancient fathers and those who were true to their spirit, were right. Because they believed in the reality of the spirit world. Because they knew that all live unto God. Because they understood that God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. Therefore, they believe that one soul can communicate with another. Now, what led people to deny this? It was partly mere reaction, as I have said. But much of it was due to materialism. People came to think that there could be no communication except by means of the senses, by the mouth and ear and eye and brain. Therefore, it followed that death set up an impassable barrier. Even the Orthodox came to think this. It was little wonder that an increasing number went a step further and said, Thought is a secretion of the brain. Therefore, when the brain is disintegrated by death, thought is no more. Therefore, the soul perishes with the body. People next set out to prove a monism of matter, that matter is the one thing. There was only one thing in the world, and that was matter, and everything living and spiritual was only a form of matter, surging up for a moment and then subsiding. But within the last year or two, we have seen this theory breaking up before our eyes. Matter itself has become the restless display of mysterious forces. The atom upon which all had been so solidly built has slipped away from under it. The atom has become a shadowy formula, or at least only the outward sign of ever-changing and mysterious whirling forces which hold it in being. The antagonism between mind and matter is giving place to a conviction that there is indeed a monism, but that the one reality is spirit. It is a spiritual monism. The once almost universal idea that we can only communicate through the senses has also been exploded. It has been proved by ample experiment that there is another and even more wonderful method of communication, which is called telepathy. Apart from the question of the departed altogether, it is certain that living people have seen things that happened far out of sight. The most wonderful instances of this are matters of ascertained fact and of not uncommon experience. But the simplest instances are sufficient. 
it is only necessary to show that a person in one room can become aware that a certain figure has been selected in another room, and you have proved the great fact, a fact which has indeed been scientifically demonstrated, viz. that there is a communication between mind and mind which is not material. We now call it telepathy. But though the word is new, the fact is as old at least as humanity, and all religion is based upon it. If there is any supreme intelligence in the world, any god, that divine intelligence must communicate itself by spiritual means. If there is any such thing as prayer, it must include a communication between men and God, which is not done through our bodily organs, which is in fact telepathic. If there are any spiritual beings at all, any saints, any souls, they must have some means of communication with each other and with God, which is independent of tongue or brain, or there would be no exchange of thought at all, that is to say, no social life, that is to say, nothing which could reasonably be dignified by the name of existence. But there is such a means of spiritual communication, and scientific experiment which once seemed to disprove it is now showing that it can exist even between our earthbound souls here in this life. What then has become of the old presumption that it is useless to ask the departed to pray for us because they cannot hear? Where are the old difficulties now that we have found that even in this mortal flesh and at our present far from perfect state of evolution, even now when man's spiritual faculties have been so little exercised and developed, soul can send messages to distant soul? Were not the old fathers right? They called it the mirror of God, and they said that those who know God know all. Were they not right? God, what does that name mean? We forget its awful immensity of content. It means one who is over there at the farthest bounds of the farthest star. It means one who is yet closer to us than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. It means one who is within the immeasurable universe and yet utterly transcends it. It means one in whom we live and move and have our being, one in whom we are one body and every one members one of another, one with whom the saints are in glory and in whom the lowest sinner can repent, one in whom is all knowledge and all power. Can any thought of ours then be forgotten, any word of ours lost, any request of ours unheard of by those who live with unveiled eyes in him? Or are the saints thus rewarded for their service that they should pass from love and fellowship here into blindness and deafness there? Nay, rather, are they not lifted into the brightness of perfect knowledge, every soul according to his degree? and every soul gaining in sight as he is brought nearer to the perfect vision. Yes, such is their reward. Out of the shadows into the sun, ex umbra in solem. For now we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now, St. Paul cried, I know in part, but then shall I know fully, even as also I have been fully known. The communion of saints, we have seen, means the fellowship in love and help in prayer of all Christian people, whether living or departed. We have also seen that the whole Christian church has held that the departed are conscious of what happens on the earth, that as we pray for them, so they also pray for us, and that it follows, therefore, that we may ask them for their prayers. Let us now conclude this subject by a short final consideration. If we may ask any departed person to pray for us, it follows a fortiori that we may ask the saints in glory to pray for us. But what is a saint 
in that sense, a glorified saint. He is a human being who has attained to the perfect vision of God. If we may ask anybody, living or departed, to pray for us, the policeman round the corner or our own dearest friend, much more may we ask a saint. For the better a man is, the more his prayers avail, and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And if we have little reason to doubt that all departed souls know our doings and our desires, we cannot doubt at all that those know who are perfected saints and enjoy the vision of God in whom is all knowledge. In the Eastern Church to this day, little distinction is made in practice. A child who has lost his mother, when he stands every night to say his prayers, will add his mother's name to those of the saints and ask her as well as them to pray for him. We conclude then that it is perfectly right to ask the saints to intercede for us and that it would be superficial to assume that they do not know our wishes. We know also that their effectual fervent prayers must avail and avail more than those of our friends upon the earth. But, it may be objected, is not this to advocate saint worship and to go against the teaching of the prayer book? I would answer that the prayer book certainly advocates the worship of a woman. It compel, compels the worship of a woman who is not even necessarily a saint, but it makes the bridegroom say, with my body I be worship. While again the law of England recognises certain individuals who do not always reach the highest ranks of sanctity as your worship. I would deliberately make this merely verbal retort because it brings out clearly that to accuse people of worshipping the saints is to use a question-begging word. Of course, it all depends upon what you mean by worship. There are in fact two kinds of worship, one which we owe to every good person and one which we owe to God alone. In the same way, there are two kinds of prayer, one which we use to human beings as, I pray you consider what you are doing, or I beg your pardon, and the other, that solemn prayer, which we can only address to God. People so easily take refuge in words. A bishop not long since ordered an inscription, pray for us, to be removed from a church window because he said it was wrong to address a petition to any created being. Of course, the objection was ridiculous. Whenever that good bishop says, please pass me the bread and butter, he is addressing a petition to a created being. Indeed, the right of addressing a humble petition to the king is one of the most cherished pillars of the British Constitution. It is true that we have no request to the saints in the prayers of our church services, but the English church is not peculiar in that. Such requests have never found place in the principal services of the church, the principal service of the church, the Lord's Supper. They occurred in litanies and hymns and in the choir services only. They thus never held a central position in the prayers of the church. Nevertheless, in popular devotion, they came to have a greatly exaggerated place. So excessive were the devotions to the saints that I, for one, do not think the reformers were wrong in not including such requests for prayer at all in the prayer book. They wished certain abuses to be forgotten. And on the other hand, they were anxious to avoid all contentious matter as much as possible. That subject had become contentious and still is so. And I'm sure if we were revising the prayer book again, we should do as the reformers did. It may well be left to people's own choice and to their private devotions, as well as to the freer atmosphere of popular hymn singing, in which, of course, there are pretty frequent addresses to the saints, as, for instance, captains of the saintly band, lights who light in every land, princes who with Jesus dwell, judges of his Israel. 
But in the official services, at least for a long time to come, we should all agree that we have sufficient witness already to the communion of saints in the commemorations of the Holy Communion and in the song of worship. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and glorify thy glorious name. We laud and magnify thy glorious name. But it would have been a very different thing if the English church had condemned the practice of asking the saints to pray for us. If she had done so, she would have condemned those very ancient fathers to whom she appeals and have cut herself off from the whole consensus of historic Christendom. She would have condemned St. Chrysostom, whose name is so honoured in the prayer book, and who in his writings sets down sentences like this, Let us flee to the intercessions of the saints, and let us beseech them to pray for us. She would have condemned St. Augustine, who tells us of the wonderful effects that came from recourse to the prayers of the martyrs. She would have, in fact, condemned as heretical those great teachers of the first six centuries whose soundness all seem now to agree in praising. In reality, by carefully singling out for condemnation in the 22nd article a particular doctrine on the matter, the Romish doctrine concerning invocation of saints, as it is there called, she made it clear that she left other doctrines on the subject an open question. That Romish or medieval doctrine was rightly condemned, as indeed the Council of Trent itself condemned it shortly after. For it allowed the saints to be asked to grant boons that are in the power of God alone and to be invoked as God only may be. And it did tend to put them in the place of God. It was not content with regarding the saints as glorified human beings who might be asked to pray just as unglorified ones may. It went beyond that and was rightly condemned. Now, what is the Catholic doctrine concerning invocations as distinct from the Romish or medieval? We can get a good idea of it if we turn away from medieval and Roman books altogether and take a modern writer of the Eastern Church. Komiakov says, We know that when any of us falls, he falls alone, but no one is saved alone. He who is saved is saved in the Church, as a member of her, and in unity with all her other members. If any one believes, he is in the communion of faith. If he loves, he is in the communion of love. If he prays, he is in the communion of prayer. Wherefore, no one can rest his hope on his own prayers. And everyone who prays asks the whole church for intercession. Not as if he had doubts of the intercession of Christ, the one advocate. But in the assurance that the whole church ever prays for all her members. All the angels pray for us, the apostles, martyrs and patriarchs, and above them all the mother of our Lord. And this holy unity is the true life of the church. But if the church, visible and invisible, prays without ceasing, why do we ask her for her prayers? Do we not entreat mercy of God and Christ, although his mercy preventeth our prayer. The very reason that we ask the Church for her prayers is that we know that she gives the assistance of her intercession even to him, that he does not ask for it, even to him that does not ask for it, and to him that asks, she gives it in far greater measure than he asks. For in her is the fullness of the Spirit of God. Thus, we glorify all whom God has glorified, and in glorifying, and is glorifying. For how should we say that Christ is living within us, if we do not make ourselves like unto Christ? And now to come back to our own Church of England, let me quote a statement which makes very clear the distinction 
between the true and false doctrine of invocations. It is from the institution of a Christian man, commonly called the Bishop's Book, which was drawn up in 1537 by Archbishop Cranmer and other bishops, and signed by all the archbishops and bishops of the English Church in that year. We think it convenient that all bishops and preachers shall instruct and teach the people committed under their spiritual charge, that for as much as the gifts of health of body, health of soul, forgiveness of sins, the gift of grace or life everlasting and such other be the gifts of God and cannot be given but by God, whosoever maketh invocation to saints for these gifts, praying to them for any of the said gifts or such like, which cannot be given but by God only, yieldeth the glory of God to his creature, contrary to his commandment. For God saith by his prophet, I will not yield my glory to any other. Therefore they that so pray to saints for these gifts, as though they could give them, or be the givers of them, transgress this commandment, yielding to a creature the honour of God. Nevertheless, to pray to saints to be intercessors with us and for us to our Lord for our suits which we make to him and for such things as we obtain of none but of him so that we make no invocation of them is lawful and allowed by the Catholic Church. With this sober declaration let me conclude. It seems to me to show that that reasonable spirit which we claim as a special characteristic of the English Church. It points a real middle way, and after all, in many matters, the middle way is the reasonable way. Our mistake generally is that we fix, whether in religion or in politics, on some extreme view and imagine that it is moderate merely because we are used to it and the majority of our fellow countrymen agree to it. And is it not so in this matter of the communion of saints? There are two extreme views. One is that of the Middle Ages, according to which the saints may be asked to grant health and grace. This is what is generally known as the invocation of saints. Not less extreme in the other direction is the view which many so-called moderate people hold today and which they get from common popular prejudice. This extreme view ignores the prayers of the church triumphant altogether. Its adherents behave as if a good man lost his power of prayer as soon as he got to heaven. They teach that you may ask a sinner to pray for you, but that you must not ask a saint. They reason as if people passed into a state of coma at death, like dormice in the winter. They practically deny that the departed live unto God because they deny that the departed have any knowledge of us. They have weakened the belief in the reality of the unseen world and have unconsciously helped to destroy any vital belief in the immortality of the soul. And they ignore that wonderful spirit of fellowship, which is an essential part of Christianity. Let us then be content with the middle way, medio tutissimus ibis. Let us above all things see that we realise that glorious communion of saints which is a transfiguration of the heart to those who know it. Let us live in that splendid brotherhood of Christian people which is a fellowship of love, sympathy, mutual help and prayer between all who love the common master of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, whether they be, whether they be militant here on earth or triumphant in the heavenly places. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love.